news flash, Jesus offers God's latest and greatest. Here we are in the final chapter, Hebrews 13, verse 1. It says, let love of the brethren continue. Love is a theme throughout the New Testament, and I'm glad that Hebrews doesn't leave it out. It ends with a reminder for everyone in the church that's receiving this letter to love each other, the brethren, the family of God. In fact, the Apostle John says that love for other Christians is what marks the Christian. We have this downloaded to our hearts, a love for each other. Remember, remember the new covenant commands that are etched on the lining of your spiritual heart. Believe in Jesus and love others even as he has loved us. God is love. And it's amazing to think about how love carries through all of Scripture. In the Old Testament, under the law, it was love the Lord God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And here in the New Testament, we see a liberating way to love. It's basically bask in the great love of Jesus Christ, soak his love in, and then reflect that love to other people. So the secret to loving other people is to be fixing your eyes on God's great love for you. That may be counterintuitive for us. We don't think about living loved. We don't think about soaking it in, maybe as often as we should. But that's what Paul prays for the Ephesians. You remember what he said. He said, I pray for you that you would know the height and the depth and the breadth and the width of the love of of Jesus Christ it surpasses knowledge and when you get to know his love you will be filled up to the measure of the fullness of God overflowing with God's love and that means toward other people so Hebrews chapter 13 begins this way talking about the love of God that can be expressed in and through us toward other people do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, of course, we don't know what specific uh, events he's talking about, but there are times in the Old Testament where angels appear and humans interact with them and they have dialogue and appear to have some sort of relationship. But what he's saying is even in present times, go ahead and let the love of Christ shine even toward those that you don't know. They're strangers to you, but why act differently toward them? Why not let that fragrant aroma of Christ ooze out of you in their direction and just love them with the love of Jesus. Some have apparently entertained messengers from heaven, angels, and they didn't even know it. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are ill-treated since you yourselves also are in the body. Is he talking about in the body of Christ? No, he's talking about in the physical body. Remember, some people are trapped physically in prison just because of their faith. And other people are being ill-treated, persecuted, killed, dragged from their homes, separated from families, tortured. Remember, those who are ill-treated, you've got a physical body too. You want to treat it well. You want it to be treated well by others. So be sensitive to those who are being persecuted and imprisoned for the gospel message. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Now, at first glance, this sounds like, oh my goodness, if I've ever fornicated, if I've ever committed adultery, then God's going to judge me for that. And then, even though I'm a Christian, the wages of sin is death, God judges me and he doles out death. Therefore, maybe I'm going to lose my salvation. Or maybe, maybe my heavenly reward is in jeopardy. Or maybe I won't have a place to live. You know, I won't be in Beverly Heavens like the rest of them. I'll be stuck in one-story purgatory because of the stuff I did. Is that what he's saying? No, in Scripture, there are a number of times when the apostles lay out this logic. 
the world will be judged and condemned for what they've done. Therefore, don't act like them. Don't act like someone you're not. You're not going to be judged and condemned, so don't act like someone who's going to be judged and condemned. The marriage bed is to be held in honor. My goodness, it's a picture of Christ and his church. And if we Christians are running around painting a picture that the marriage doesn't have to be respected and that in, infidelity is A-OK, well, then what does that say about Jesus and the church? You know, in this same chapter, he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. That's the picture that he wants marriage to portray to other people, reflecting the reality of Christ and his bride, whom he will never cheat on. So let marriage be held in honor because the marriage bed should be undefiled. And people who act like that, well, those are typically unbelievers who are going to be judged for that. So why would you act like them? Don't act like someone that you're not. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. It's interesting that money is linked to God's presence here. In other words, don't let the love of money consume you because people chase after the love of money because they want to make sure, well, that they're always safe and secure, that they always have a bright future, that they're never alone, that they have good circumstances, that they're comfortable. So he's rightly linking money and God's presence because what he's saying here is don't put your confidence in the comfort of, and the cushy circumstances that money brings you. Instead, put your confidence and your trust in the never-ending presence of God. Even if you end up with nothing, even if you're bankrupt, you've got Jesus. So there's a confidence here that you can move forward in, knowing that you have something untakeable. No one can take it from you the presence of God himself that is irrevocable. It'll never be revoked. He's always with you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Wow. If God is for us, who can be against us? This is yet another way to express that important truth that nobody can really touch you. They can't take your spirit. They can't take your life in Christ. They can't take his presence from you. Yes, circumstances change. You know, we're riding that roller coaster of the soul up and down and all around, and life is stressful, and money, money can make it worse. But we have something that can never be taken, and we have an anchor for the soul, and it's Jesus himself. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. A respect for leaders. Quite candidly, there are some who don't seem to have a respect for church leaders. They think there's no place for church leaders. But there are dozens of passages about leaders in the early church and just showing a general respect for them. One passage says that they are worthy of double honor if they're leading as an elder, for example. God designed the church not that we would have a hierarchy of worth and value, but we've got to have some sort of leadership, otherwise the ship goes down. And clearly, for 2,000 years, in one form or another, when there's been healthy church, there have been healthy leaders. Now, in this same passage, he says, imitate their faith. Did you notice he didn't say imitate their conduct? He says, having observed their conduct, having witnessed how they behave, imitate their trust, imitate their faith, because we're not all cookie-cutter Christians. It's not about us all fitting into the same mold. What he's saying here is that we're each unique, but what we share is a dependency on the Father. 
So if there's someone in your life and you respect their conduct and you know that they're a believer, don't imitate their conduct, imitate their faith. What does that tell you? Well, God cares about source, not just product. God cares about source. So recognize the source and look to it. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. God cares more about the process and the source than he does the final product. There are many people of world religions who have a really good-looking final product. They have good works to show off, and yet they don't even know Jesus from a hole in the wall. So clearly, it matters. Process and source. Jesus is our source, and he is our process as we look to him. So this passage continues in verse 8. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, this passage alone is truth. I mean, we could shout this verse from the rooftops. We could put it on a billboard. We could hold it up on a poster during a football game. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's a true statement. But what does it mean in context? I mean, we know that he's never changing. But the next verse really helps us. Where the author is going is he is saying, don't be carried away by some trendy movement. Don't be carried away by some new doctrine or teaching. Remember, Jesus is the same every single day so the gospel is going to sound like a broken record right and i love that i hope that when i'm 95 years old they call me a broken record because i kept harping on the same truths of the gospel and kept highlighting the importance of jesus as our sole focus and that's what he's saying here as it continues he says don't be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. He's talking about the dead works of the temple, Jewish practices, feasts and festivals, people being occupied with trying to please God through all of that. Don't be carried away by those or by any strange teaching that would distract you. It's good, it's good to be focused on God's grace. Now, moments ago, I said it's good to be focused on Jesus. And here, the passage says it's good to be focused on grace. So is that a conflict? Of course not, because Jesus is full of grace and truth. The scripture tells us that, that what he is to us is grace upon grace. He's full of grace. So it's incredible to think about how grace is a person and his name is Christ Jesus. Grace is not just a doctrine. Grace is not just information. Grace is Jesus himself and he lives in us and he's full of grace. And that's how he, he acts toward us. That's how he treats us. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to, to eat. What's he saying? I mean, we don't have an altar. Where's the altar? You go into churches today, maybe they've fabricated an altar up front out of wood, you know, for the altar calls. But seriously, there are no altars. There's only the cross. The cross replaces all altars. So what does he mean here? He's talking figuratively. He's saying we have a place to eat. We have an altar. We've been invited to a table to feast on God's goodness in a way that those people know nothing about because they're focused on Moses and the law. They're focused on their own works, their own obedience, and they're missing out on what we enjoy as we feast on God's goodness through the gospel message. We have a table. We have an altar. We have a place. We have a meal. We have a Savior that they know nothing about. That's his point. 
And it goes hand in hand with everything we've seen in this series, right? We have a a new covenant that's founded on better promises, a better high priest. And they know nothing of this because they refuse to enter God's rest. And they instead put their confidence in the blood of bulls and goats and sacrifices that do nothing to take away sins. But Jesus has taken away our sins forever and we know it and we're feasting on his goodness. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. What's he talking about? He's about to contrast Jesus and those Old Testament sacrifices. And you remember the practice, don't you? After they offered the animal sacrifices, they had all of these carcasses laying around. What are they going to do with these dead animals? So they take them outside the city, outside the city gate, and they burn them. And what a stench it reeked out there. Are you kidding me? That is not where you want to be. And yet, in a moment, you'll see that's exactly where we are invited at least figuratively, symbolically, that's where we are invited, outside the city. Here it comes. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. All right? It's, it's coming. It's one verse away, but it's coming. And he's building the case for it. So the animals... They were taken outside the city and they were burned and it was a smelly, detestable place. And guess what? That's where Jesus went to shed his blood. That's where Jesus went to be crucified. No, he was not in the temple. He was not in the magnificent grandeur, the mega temple area. No, no. He was in the low budget trash dump area where the animal carcasses were disposed of, and the smell was wretched. That's where he was crucified. And so, in that rank place, in that aroma of death, Jesus was killed for our sins forever. He took them away, something that blood of bulls and goats could never do. And here comes the invitation, and I love it one of the most powerful passages in all of Scripture, one of my favorites, Hebrews 13, 13. Here it is. So, let us go out to Him outside the camp, bearing His reproach. Do you see this? It almost makes me cry every time I I read it. You're going to be in a place that's not so popular. You're going to be in a place that's not high budget. You're going to be in a place that's not about grandeur and pretense and circumstance. You're going to be in a place where it might smell at times. You're going to be in a place where the religious community doesn't even understand why you've gone out there. You're going to be out there because that's where Jesus was. And that's where he is with you in your life. So, let us go outside the walls of organized religion. Let us go outside the walls of legalism. Let us go outside the walls of country club church. Let us go outside. And we might even bear some reproach. We might even get some criticism. People might not understand why we don't want to be in the big mega temple where all the money is. But we know why. Because Jesus went out there to be killed for our sins. And what matters is truth. Not how popular something is, but how truthful it is. Do you see this? This invitation is glorious. Because in the midst of that trash heap of animals, the carcasses laying everywhere, the stench being nearly unbearable, We've got the truth. And when people don't get us and they don't understand us, we've got the truth. So let us go out to him and even bear some criticism along the way. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. 
He spoke of this in the last chapter, which we saw recently, right? In this series, we looked at the two mountains, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. We looked at the temporal and the eternal. We looked at the old covenant and the new covenant. We looked at the earth that is passing away and the idea of a new earth and a new body. He's still on that theme here. We don't seek a city that's going to be crumbling. We seek a city that endures forever, the kingdom of God, which we're already a part of. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. Again, a theme from the last chapter. We saw previously that true service, true sacrifice is giving thanks to God. The big wow and thank you. We keep thinking he wants more from us. He wants that heroic effort on our part to do more and be more and serve more in some sort of grandiose, visible way. And yet again, not only in chapter 12, but also here in chapter 13, he is saying this to us. That what he really wants, the sacrifice that really pleases him, is not another bull and not another goat and not another attempt at lifeless service that means nothing, that doesn't come from the heart. What really impresses him, what he really wants from us, is for us to look at his son and say, wow, and thank you, the fruit of lips that give thanks to God. That's what impresses him. That is our reasonable act of worship. That is our service. That's what he wants. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Do you see where it all starts? It starts with wow. It continues with thank you. And the result is that there's an outpouring toward other people. But it's not out of a bitterness. It's not biting your lower lip and trying to make life work. It's the fruit of lips that give thanks to our God. It's not about putting on a mask and fake it till you make it. It's not gritting your teeth and trying to be nice when you're not. It's letting the gospel inspire you and motivate you. You've got to start there. Otherwise, we just end up resentful. We're resentful because we feel bad, but we're supposed to act good. We, f- we resent what God has done if we think the gospel is that he's never pleased with us, but we should be nice to others. We've got to let the gospel speak. And when the proper foundation is laid and we know that we are loved and cherished and forgiven and free and secure and safe forever, something wells up within us. And then what we do and say is legit, it's genuine, it's real, because the source is different and the process is different. It's not just about the product, it's about how we get there. So let the grace of God speak and let his grace motivate. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Don't stress your leaders out, first of all. Secondly, he's saying submit to them. Now, obviously, if there are abusive leaders, if there are leaders that are taking you in an abusive direction, if there's cruelty and manipulation and and all of those horrible things, then bolt for the door. Get out. Get away from that. But he's talking about healthy church. And in the context of healthy church, obey your leaders because they keep a careful watch over you. That's a care-filled watch over you. And then it says, as those who will give an account, uh uh-oh, does that mean that if you're a pastor, a teacher, a leader, an elder, a deacon, that you're going to have to give a special account in heaven. You're pulled out of line, right? There you are at the gates of heaven. You're pulled out of line. All of the elders over here, please. All of the deacons over here. Uh, Sunday school leaders, you're back over here. We're all going to give a special account. Is that what he's saying? That's not what he's saying. Paul would write Timothy and ask him about the congregation. Timothy would give an account of how things were going. 
Timothy was a leader. Paul would write another church and ask how things were going in Corinth or Ephesus or elsewhere. The apostles would check in on local congregations and the leaders would give an account of how things were going locally in those bodies. It has nothing to do with the final judgment. If we were going to give an account of ourselves, our account is that God keeps no record. The Lord doesn't take our sins into account. He remembers our sins no more. That's not what this is about. This is simply about the responsibility that local leaders bear. And in those days, the apostles were traveling messengers and they would check in and visit different congregations to encourage them. And they would find out from the leaders how things were, the state of the union, the status quo. And so we see in verse 18, it says, Pray for us, for we are sure, we're sure that we have a good conscience desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. Let your conscience be programmed by the gospel. You know, a conscience can go off at anything. Your conscience could go off when you square dance, if you grew up believing that dancing is always sin. Your conscience could go off when you play a card game, if you grew up in the 1940s, perhaps, or 1950s or 60s, believing that playing cards was sinful. I give you these outlandish examples to show you the conscience can be programmed by anything. So we don't want to fall at the feet of our conscience. We want our conscience programmed by the gospel of grace because when they're properly programmed, then they can certainly be followed. So he says, again here in verse 18, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And I urge you all the more to do this so that I may be restored to you sooner. He's excited to see him again. And that's just friendship. That's just love. That's just care. So here in verse 20, he says, Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord. May he equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. But I urge you, brethren, Bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. <laughs> this is his idea of briefly. Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom, if he comes soon, I will see you. Greet all of your leaders and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you as well. Grace be with you all. That's how he ends it. Grace be with you all. So he talks about how it's Christ in us, that it's Christ through us, that anything that's produced that is of value in terms of the fruit of the Spirit, it's going to be the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the law. He brings up the blood of the covenant. He brings up Jesus again as the shepherd of the sheep. We're being led by someone who gave his life. He laid it down for us. He showed us humility, and then he leads us in a very humble way, something we're not used to. Maybe we're used to pressure and manipulation. We're used to being coerced, and yet the Lord will never act that way toward us. And I love how he ends this letter, his final words that go so perfectly with what we stand for here. Grace be with you all. And isn't grace with all of us? Isn't that the whole purpose of the gospel? That it's grace upon grace unleashed in our direction. Grace before us and behind us, on our right and on our left. Grace beneath us for support. Grace in the future, grace for the past. Grace everywhere. It's grace multiplied to us in Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep. We can trust him. He loves us. He'll never leave us. He's given us something unshakable and unbreakable. This new covenant of God's grace is off the charts. And Jesus has brought us God's latest and greatest. Let's pray together. Father, 
We thank you for this beautiful privilege of looking into your word. We love it. We crave it. We sink our teeth into this truth, and it really does set us free. We thank you for Jesus and all that he's done. We thank you for his finished work that we are forgiven forever and made righteous forever, that we are safe and we trust you. We believe you. We say, wow, and we thank you. And in that way, we offer our sacrifice, our simple sacrifice of praise, saying we are impressed with Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.